My name is Tom Goldsby. I'm with the University of Tennessee, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's masterclass session. Uh, the masterclass series uh, dedicated to warehouse technology excellence is brought to you by Kerber Supply Chain. I'm pleased to be working today with Peter Feinstra. Peter is the Chief Supply Chain Officer or Chief Sales Officer uh, for Kerber Supply Chain. And he's going to be presenting a topic titled From a Manual to Fully Automated Warehouse. Again, I will serve as your host. My name is Tom Goldsby. I'm the Haslam Chair of Logistics and Professor of Supply Chain Management, the Haslam College of Business at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, Tennessee. I also serve as the co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Business Logistics. And I'm joined today by Peter Feenstra. Peter is the Chief Sales Officer for Kerber Supply Chain Automation. He brings more than 30 years of experience in supply chain technologies to his current capacity at Kerber Supply Chain including leadership roles and assignments from around the world. It's hard to imagine a better person to deliver today's message. It's a great pleasure to have you with us, Peter. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. I'm going to turn things over to you in just a few minutes, but please allow me to go over a, a few items first and set the stage. Uh, some of you may just be joining us for the first time. You might be wondering what this master class is all about, why we're here. Well, we're here to tackle the challenges of today's increasingly complex supply chain, bringing you best practices and innovative thinking from academics like myself and industry insiders and senior leaders like Peter. Uh, I mentioned today's handout uh, that is available to everyone uh, in the handout tab of the GoToWebinar menu, and it's very timely uh, to this mission of addressing supply chain complexity. In fact, that's what Kerber Supply Chain examined in a recent survey conducted among more than 1,200 supply chain professionals. In that survey, one of the takeaways they found is that 91% of respondents indicate that they cannot get ahead of supply chain complexities and challenges. And frankly, I think I'd like to meet the 9% that claim they can do that uh, because complexity is coming at us in a fast and furious manner. So what we're trying to accomplish is to provide guidance and insights in managing your supply chain as a competitive advantage a strategic asset, an opportunity to excel, ultimately conquering supply chain complexity. So you see our class schedule. Again, this is the fifth and final installment in this particular master class. But don't despair. If you've missed any of the previous class sessions, you can catch these sessions on demand. Uh, also, you'll have access to previous master class series that we've dedicated to topics like addressing labor challenges and cold storage trends. So you'll find a link to this uh, session, as well as all previous sessions in this master class, as well as our previous master classes in a mailing that we'll send to you inside of the next 48 hours. So with that understanding, let's go ahead and go over some housekeeping items. All of your phone lines are muted. Uh, again, the session is being recorded and can be uh, made available to you later for viewing. We welcome your questions. If you have questions for Peter, uh, please go to the GoToWebinar uh, questions tab, and we're going to reserve some time at the end of today's session for Peter to address your questions. Uh, just again, remind you of the handout that we have uh, titled Five Insights, What Supply Chain Complex Complexity Looks Like in 2020 uh, that is available uh, for free uh, right there in the GoToWebinar menu. So let's go back and take a look at today's poll question. Uh, the question again was, in a previous implementation of an advanced supply chain technology, which element or elements have been instrumental to success? And you see the results there. Uh, several, uh, four of the five options had over 50% response with planning coming in highest at 68%, followed closely by IT integration at 65%, and then tied for third, at 57%, we're transitioning from existing to a new system, as well as support after go live. And then finally, the one option that came in a little under 50% at 41% was change management. And then Peter, I believe you're going to address all of these aspects. I think they're all probably regarded as central to the success of a, an advanced supply chain technology, particularly something of the order of automation. So with that, let's go ahead and proceed and, and take our deep dive into automation. And uh, again, our topic today is from a manual to fully automated warehouse. And when we speak of warehouse automation, it conjures up many possibilities. 
and seemingly the possibilities are growing uh, day after day. But here are four such examples in action. In the top left, you'll see a system from Magazino doing automated order picking of shoe boxes in warehouses jointly with people. I I'm told this is a startup with much potential. Uh, in the left bottom is a system implemented for, with a, a company called Superboc, um, which is uh, a majority owned company from uh, a favorite brewery of mine, uh, Danish owned Carlsberg. Um, and this is uh, beer production and storage uh, in Portugal operation. Going back up to the top right are some shots of a Kerber installed system with conveyors and palletizers. And then in the bottom right is an auto store system gaining some interest in the goods to person space. We're seeing a lot of, of uh, creativity, action in the goods to person space. And this is one such example. And again, automation takes on many forms and purposes, but generally to increase efficiency and accuracy in warehouse operations. And we featured many such innovations in our recent mastery class sessions on warehouse technology excellence, as well as cold storage trends, our, our previous masterclass. So if we can go ahead and move on to our next slide. Um, obviously, not all implementations are met with the success that's desired. Uh, history of automation implementations are, are marked by successes, but also littered with some disappointments too. And this slide speaks to some of the more well-known examples and documented cases of each. As for the good ones, uh, over on the left-hand column, you see some headlines of uh, companies like SIVA uh, that found success with autonomous mobile robots, or AMRs, um, from a KSC, Kerber Supply Chain group company called Cohesio. Uh, below that is a headline from Americold with a, a freezer application done by Bastion with a Kerber Supply Chain layer pick, picker in it. And then Coca-Cola, which installed a large automated facility close to London. And so those are some examples of success. But uh, again, there are examples of failure that also see the light of day. And one such uh, popularly covered example was Foxmeyer, a drug distribution company that saw major setbacks with its automated system and automation equipment. Both IT and automation controls uh, reportedly had huge bugs. Uh, also, uh, as a more recent example, uh, automated storage retrieval system uh, did great uh, with retrieving goods, but not putting away uh, incoming goods, uh, causing incomplete orders among other problems. And this is, was mainly regarded as an IT issue. And then there's the story of Sainsbury's, a huge IT and barcode uh, set of problems at four highly automated DCs, which they closed eventually. Uh, a lot of white papers uh, reported on this. Um, and uh, it was uh, a large, large project and uh, met with some disappointment. Lots of lessons learned there. So Peter, as we look at these examples of, of good and, and bad implementations of automation, how can we end up in the win column and not the loss column when it comes to implementing automation? This is certainly a, a huge undertaking. So any advice you can lend would, I think, be much appreciated by our audience. Good. Thanks very much, Tom. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, you saw on the previous page some examples of very good implementations, but also some uh, very bad ones. And I can still remember the, uh, the Sainsbury case, which was in the mid-90s, so long ago. And you can Google it. You will find a lot of papers on it. But you can clearly see in those papers that it was actually not so much an, a problem of bad uh, products or bad automation equipment or so, but basically a bad preparation of the project as such. And I think that is the, uh, that, that comes down close to the team we are discussing today, what kind of topics to consider when you plan an automation job so that you can be always on the left hand side uh, on the bad, on the good implementations and not ending up at the wrong side. So I will go through a number of these topics. You can see seven here. I could easily uh, find a few more, but we somehow have to stick within the 15 minutes as well that Tom gave me. So uh, we tackle these uh, seven. So let's go to the, the first one on the next slide. So that starts with the design data. So ultimately, you want to implement an automated system, perhaps for the year 2025, so for the coming five years. 
So we need to know what that system has to do. So first of all, the, uh, the supplier or the consultant or whoever does the design uh, for you will ask a lot of questions on your current data. So number of articles, orders, order lines, uh, flows, etc. Stock turnaround times, you can read them here. That is sometimes still doable if you want to say stay, stay to an existing plant and you're just growing that plant. Uh, then you can retrieve those data normally from the ERP or from an existing WMS system. Of course, if you plan a greenfield, it's already getting a bit more complicated. But still, current data somehow is okay. But we want to develop a system that is lasting, let's say, or is designed for five years from now. So then the question will be, how is your current data going to develop? And I have had also customers tell me, okay, that's quite easy, just plan with 10% growth. But then, of course, the question comes, is that 10% growth in what? Is it articles? Will it grow as well? Or just orders? Or the same number of orders, but more order lines? And is it the same number of pieces per order line? So there's a lot of things that can, can change. And it's very important that you get, that you spend enough time looking at that to have the correct design data for the year 2025, because the design you will develop will be based, we made for those data. If you don't know it uh, completely, then allow a certain error margin and make the desi design more, let's say, able to deal with that error margin as well. Maybe they're not spot ideal, but at least uh, cover with the uncertainty you have. Again, if you take the wrong de design data in five years from now, you may end up with the wrong design, not delivering the throughput that you have, uh, that you are looking for. So that's the, the first thing. Then if you go to the next one, it's, okay, now I want to plan this automated uh, system. Um, where do I start? Uh, and who do I engage with? Of course, there is the classical approach where you uh, ask a consultant to, first of all, challenge you on the design data and do that analysis part. And often they also then can do the design for you and then send out an RFQ to the different suppliers to quote on it. I tend to favor personally the model, model if you go for a consultant that do mainly the design data challenging with them and allow some creativity with the supplier because the consultant will normally come up with one design. Suppliers, if you send it to two or three or four, they come up with perhaps two, three or four designs where you can, let's say, get the optimum creativity from different people thinking through your design data. Of course, it's then more complicated to judge the different suppliers but I'm, uh, I'm really convinced you get a better design overall. Another option, which is done sometimes by small uh, customers going directly to a supplier that they can trust, or large customers that can do this design part themselves, huh, that they have done, uh, take, a, take a Coca Cola, they have a lot of, done a lot of projects themselves already. So they come up with a design and then go straight to a supplier. Often ask them as well, okay. Do you have other ideas, some creativity, creativity built in? But then again, they, uh, then the supplier will do that jointly with the customer and ultimately then you have a design as well. And then as a customer, you have to select the right system integrator uh, slash supplier to deliver you the overall system. And that is very important. Of course, you have already got an impression during the sales phase and the design phase on which partner to trust but you will also look for, in, uh, for references and to look what kind of integration capabilities, let's say between software, automation and mechanics, these different suppliers bring to the table. Ultimately, I think you will do a rational part, yeah, checking reference, et cetera, but you will also select a partner you have uh, come to trust with during the past months of design. Good, then. If we got all the data right and the design data in five years from now, then we have to look at different concepts for the different elements of a system. And I just take the three main ones in the material handling part. So I'm mainly looking at the equipment portion here. So we will look at the storage area, very much driven by, for example, the number of pallets we need to store, but also the number of pallets per skew we have or per article or per skew batch combination. Because if you have large batches of the same product, you may, let's say, use a system that is multi-deep, so more pallets behind each other, or more bins behind each other, or crates behind each other. If you have a very limited number of pallets uh, per skew, you'll probably go for a single or double-deep grain system or shuttle system. 
if you have uh, very limited throughput and you can do it with block stacking, you may find a solution like in the middle with an, uh, with an, uh, an AGV. Uh, so not a huge equipment. Uh, you cannot go too high, uh, but let's say in a low throughput, block stacking can also be a perfect solution. So there are a lot of different ways to cover your storage capacity. On the bottom part, you see then uh, on the bottom left, you see a shuttle system, which is mostly used currently with, uh, for crates and carton uh, storages. So on a lower, uh, let's say, on the smaller quantities. So that's storage already, on, and there's only a few that I've pictured here. On the transportation uh, part, so conveying uh, certain equipment, then classical, we have the conveyor systems, like you see on the top, either for crates, for cartons, or for pallets. You see also in the middle an RGV system, a rail guided vehicle. Um, actually, that's also implemented in the Superbox beer system that, uh, that Tom showed before. So that is often used for large distances and large throughputs. So you don't have big conveyor systems there, but you have actually these kind of shuttles that drive in loops around with the pallets with high throughput. And then on the bottom part, you see again AMRs, AGVs. So most of the time for less throughput and large distances and more flexibility. So you don't block anything. Again, even there are more transportation means, but you can see depending on the throughput, the flexibility, uh, there are different ways to solve certain topics, bringing products from A to B. And then we go to the picking part. Also there, there are many more options, but just to give a few, uh, we have uh, layer picking. So picking full layers of a pallet and either putting on another pallet, so create so-called rainbow pallets, so different layers of different products on one pallet. Or what they're also used for is take a layer off, de-scramble them, so make individual packages out of it, store them perhaps in a shuttle system, and later on pick them one by one. Other part you see, uh, example you see on the right bottom corner, either it's voice picking on the middle left, you have uh, AMR supported picking on the middle uh, uh, right, you have the pick to life system uh, on, the, on the bottom left, and even our sortation systems uh, with uh, AMRs, so replace uh, sorters with uh, AMR that I have sorting capability. So you can see there's a lot of different ways of uh, putting a total concept together, because ultimately it will then be a combination of all these different aspects. So you can have more, multiple transportation means, you can have multiple storage areas for pallets and for crates, and you can have multiple picking systems. And the cleverness is to find one design that covers your design data, which we developed shortly before. And we will run different designs to, let's say, also see the different investment levels and different operational cost levels. We go to the next part, because this was then the mechanical part. Uh, the real challenge, and I think it was also number one or number two, I think, in the poll, is the IT integration part. And actually, if you see the examples that were in the, uh, in the bad implementation part, uh, most of them had some level of IT integration issues with it. So just take the example here. We have now developed our system on the previous page in the middle, middle section on the bottom. So what's called automated logistic system. So that part with the handling we have covered, different subsystems. Uh, then there's a lot, you can see there's a lot of other boxes in there. So first of all, we have the, the WCS, uh, the, the wireless control system, or sometimes the interior for control system, that steers that part of equipment that we have just designed before. But you see, at the other hand, the same side may have already an automated system on the right-hand side, steered by another system. Maybe manual warehouses as well on the, on the left-hand part. And we have a WMS often sitting on top of it, and there an ERP sitting on top of that again as well. And all of that somehow have to work in sync. So what are some of the challenges? First of all, is where to keep what data. So for example, if you wanna have a pallet that is stored at a specific location in that automated warehouse, where do we register that specific location? Could that be in the WCS or WMS or in the EP or on all three? Uh, I think that is crucial to find out because if you put it too high up, you'll probably your system is not, uh, let's say, uh, uh, performant enough, uh, so you probably want to have it further lower down, and then still, let's say, keep track on overall quantities in the levels more up. But all these things you have to functionally specify and to design. Another challenge is that systems are depending on each other. So it may be that the, our system in the middle works perfectly, uh, so all the systems run fine, but Nothing is coming out. Why? Because we are waiting for products to come from the manual controlled warehouse or from the other automated system. So 
So also the, the, the sync of the total system will define the throughput also of our system that we are implementing now. So I think this is the area where most of the errors occur during implementation. So really spend time finding the, the right level of integration and also the dependencies on the other system and clearly then decide what to put where and how that will work together. Good, then we go to the next one. The planning, that was actually number one, I remember, in the poll. Uh, uh, very close by the IT integration part. Yes, I think very important as well. Also there, I took a number of blocks. I could even have uh, more blocks than I have here, but just took the main ones out. So the design, we already spoke about that. Uh, uh, it's not just make the design, but actually if it's a more complicated system, also to think about simulating the design, to making sure that the system will ultimately deliver what we have designed it for. So no, don't find it out on site whether it works or not. I'll try to simulate it properly uh, before. That simulation you can keep because you can all use, you also use it in the future as well. If you run future, let's say, order scenarios or you have different peaks or so, we can still uh, use a simulation to see how our system is dealing uh, with that. Okay, then you go to the development and production, programming, everything. And then we go in testing. Testing is very important because the battery you test in the office, the less through the less time you need on site and the less cost you will have on site as well. That's both for the supplier as for the customer. And more and more there you see the next step of simulation, which is uh, uh, which is called emulation, where you can have uh, emulators simulating different parts of the system. So for example, if you want to test the WMS WCS, you may have an emulator for all the PLCs connected to it. So you can actually run the WMS WCS without anything else and check that functionality. Or putting it one level down, you test the, the, the PLC and have emulators below the PLC emulating the sensors and, and activators. So actually testing the mechanics and electrics before you go on site. Extremely important if you want to be sure that your implementation on site goes according to schedule. Okay, then at some stage the building is ready and we start installing and commissioning. That typically one of the, uh, the critical points is that you will have a lot of different companies sitting on the same site, often not uh, uh, covered under one contract. So as a customer, you have to make sure that the building contractor, perhaps the different warehouse contractors or other contractors on site are very well managed. Otherwise, people will be wait waiting on each other, so you will need more time, and they will start claiming the customer as well because the waiting time was not part of their contract. So making really sure that ID have one party let's say that's responsible or you have a very good site management in place on the customer side to coordinate the different contractors. After the installation commissioning, we will do the acceptance testing. And uh, there it's very important already in the design phase to, be, to decide how you're going to quantify when a system is ready. So very have very clear acceptance criteria that you define very early in the process. So that we there is no discussion between customer and supplier that are we now really ready? You know, it's quantifiable. You do the test, you tick it off, you're either ready or you're preliminary ready and you have a snack list or so, but there should be no, let's say, contention area there. Then extremely important uh, training because ultimately you will have to, I come back to that a bit later, you will be uh, you will have to run with that system. And if you're not used to a very much automated system, uh, it is different than your manual uh, stuff you had before. So it's training very important, but come back to it. The transition to a new system, I think that was not scoring too high. Okay, change management was the lowest one, but not too high in the poll. Uh, it depends really on uh, how, um, what, what kind of a current situation you come. If, for example, you have a, a currently an automated, a manual side, and you move slowly to an automated side, you will have, let's say, orders that potentially are delivered from two different warehouses. So you may have to split orders and consolidate them later. So all of that you have to think through, let's say if you go live, that you will have at that stage two systems in parallel, which means some level of order splitting or an order consolidation. So how do you then serve your customers in, in that period of time? Also a good question is, how long will that transition take? And when do we feel safe enough to switch off the old between bracket system, if, it, if there is one thing to be switched off or manual side to be emptied? So these things you have to think through already at the very start of the project so that you can just execute them at the end. Good, then we talked a lot about te technology and um, 
that's very important, of course, that we that we select the right staff and we integrate it together exactly. But we should not forget the people aspect. And I noticed that this scored uh, lowest in the poll, which surprised me a bit um, because actually it is not so always that easy. Take a simple example: uh, you have uh, you have never done an automated system. You have run, let's say, manual systems, and uh, your team leader. Uh, he's there for 25 years. He knows everything in and out in that site. So he knows, man, even without the WMS, he knows where the products are. He knows how the customers want to have it delivered. So he can really steer that whole uh, site. Now we're going to put a full automated site in. All of, a sudden, all of a sudden, the capabilities and experience of that person for that part of the, the job is not that relevant anymore because, yes, the system knows where it is and you may not know it anymore. And it is very important that you have uh, people that uh, that also understand the analytical part of the system with it. So you have to get people on board very early that also, let's say, are getting familiarized with the total system on an early stage. So often people with a bit of um, acquaintance to IT, but specifically also with some analytical skills that they understand hey, how different systems may work. So define those key persons that run the, these automated systems already in early stage and get them on board during the project. Also, the rest of the team. I mean, ultimately, the, the, the automated system does not mean you have no people. Most of the time, there are still a lot of people around it as well. And they will, whether it's an order picker or a maintenance guy or a shift leader, jointly, they will define whether this project will be a success. So if there is no acceptance of your crew of such an automated system from the beginning, you will have a hard time or and we will have a hard time making that to a success so it is very important that, that everybody is let's say somehow made enthusiastic from the beginning because if they're let's say the people around in automated system are enthusiastic and are willing to make it work they have a much bigger chance on success that it really is going to work as well so two just two examples of uh, of such elements so I already touched upon it about the part of the uh, uh, of the training part. So a lot of people think that, yeah, I buy a turnkey system. So when the acceptance test was successful, I take the key and we drive off with the system. Uh, but then I take the parallel with the Formula One car. And of course, uh, uh, I'm Dutch, so allow me to use the Max Verstappen Red Bull Formula One car in this case. He's still number three, so he still has to beat Hamilton in this case. But uh, you can see that is a car you cannot just sit in, turn the key and drive off. Even your first car when you were 16 or 18, uh, depending on which country you were, you could not just drive off. You had to take lessons to do that. And that is in, in such an automated case as well. So if you have never had an automated system before, you have to learn how to drive uh, that system. And then there are two options. So either you have uh, you uh, plan to run that system yourself, which is still most of the time the case, and then you have to make sure that that whole training exercise is done and you probably have uh, discussed with your supplier a certain ramp up period where you also have an on the job training for two to three months potentially depending on the complexity of the system to be able to let's say run it yourself another option is uh, which we see now more and more as well with the more complicated systems uh, specifically uh, that even the running of the technical part of the system is uh, is outsourced to the supplier of the equipment so both of the one are possible and specifically the one on the left i think is uh, is done mostly with uh, customers that have already a technical experience for example production plans that also do a warehouse on the right hand side you see sometimes that it is uh, done by a retail for example company that has no equipment and uh, also no people doing the maintenance so they outsource uh, not just the maintenance but also the running of the system itself good then we go to the last slide, I think. So you can see, actually, there is um, uh, a lot of things to, to think of. Yeah, we talked about the data, uh, which partner to use, supplier or consultant, in which format, what concept to develop, specific topic on the IT integration, where often the errors are made, uh, proper planning, the people part of it, and specifically the, 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 the support after go live. But if you do that consciously, just, just don't jump into it, but really take care of these steps, I'm pretty sure you will have a successful project like the project you see here on the screen. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Peter. Thank you so much. You've